drill, uh, before I go to this, this topic, uh, the zero value we saw with variables, now we can just define all the zero values because now we know all the types. Uh, so integers, all of the ints, int 8, int 16, all the units, they're all zero. That's the zero value. So if you don't give it a value, it's going to be zero. It'll be a u int, a u int 8 ish zero, but it's a zero. Okay. Every following? And then plus 64, same thing, 0, 0.0. Plus 32, 0.0. 0. Uh, a string, empty string, a boolean, default to false. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much the ones we'll see. We'll see later other zero values, but for the basic types, uh, those are them. There is a null, but it's for pointers. Okay. Uh, we haven't looked at pointers. Um, okay, so I'm just going to cover this briefly. I, you know, I had this grand idea of trying to do this in more in depth, but I think it's too much to tackle. Uh, there is a really important component about this, um, and that's the way the computer works. So I thought maybe we could just briefly talk about that and try to get an idea. Uh, so maybe I'll draw a diagram here. Um, well, I guess I have a diagram in here. So when we have stuff on a computer, uh, we have main memory, RAM, random access memory. And all data on the computer is stored in RAM, right? And so when our program does things, when we have a variable, uh, it's going to store it in main memory. And so the interesting thing about the binary idea is that we can store anything as binary data. That's the idea, okay? Anything we can think of, we can store as binary data, as zeros and ones. And then we have this memory, which all it cares about is zeros and ones. And therefore, we can store anything in main memory. Okay, that's the idea. So you can think of main memory as like a big, huge uh, post office, okay? With all these mailboxes. Each one of those mailboxes has a number, an address, okay? Like here's box 1000, 1000. When we store the string hello world, what we're doing is we're storing it in boxes sequentially. So H goes in 1001, E goes in 1002, L goes in 1003, and so on. Okay? And so that's how we're storing it in memory. right? And then when we pass it around, what we're passing around is the address. So we're passing around the address of the box. Okay? Now Go is doing this behind the scenes for us. When we compile, it's figuring all that. Okay? Uh, it's not something we have to control. Um, so that, that's this idea of printing X is like printing, you know, box thousand one through box thousand one. That's kind of what it's doing behind the scenes. Okay. Uh, the reason this matters is sometimes we have to deal with memory more directly, and so it's nice to know that in the end, everything we're doing on a program is stored in memory in this uh, pretty clear way. Okay. Any questions about this? This can be a little confusing. Um, so maybe if we saw an example, we saw that ampersand operator. Okay. Uh, ampersand you can think of as address. So take the address of. Okay. So I took the address of the string. So it's like I have the string and I want to find out which box it's stored in. Okay. Which box it starts in. And this is what that's telling me when I do the ampersand. Skip that box number. And you can see it's this really big hexadecimal number. So main memory is huge, right? Gigs and gigs of memory. Um, so there's lots of these boxes, and that's what this is. Okay. So all the variables are end up being stored that way. Okay. So the interesting thing about the way a computer works is it turns out your program itself is stored in memory, uh, and that can be—it's like a mind-blowing idea that I'm putting my code in memory in addition to all my data. And then it loads your code from memory and executes it. Um, so when we compile a program, uh, and there's like a hex dump. Um, there's this huge block of data that it generates. Uh, Go, Go executables are very large. And, and all of these are instructions that the computer knows how to, to run. And so what we're doing is we're translating code in Go into code that the computer understands. And that code is called assembly. Uh, that's like the higher order human readable version of the machine code. Um, and so that's, that's what the compiler is doing, is it's creating this huge thing. So what happens is when we run our program, it's going to load that in the main memory. It's going to go, go to the first box, run it. And then it does all this other stuff. Okay. 
So that's, that's basically the process of what a compiler does, is it creates that for us. This huge list of instructions. So then, yeah. When you have a chance, I have a question. Sure. Okay, now. Uh, <laughs> so you, you did that little ampersand thing for a little variable, and then it showed the memory location. How much memory can be stored in each RAM post postal box? And what if you have a variable that's taking up many postal boxes? Because the ampersand thing showed us one hexadecimal. Was that the address to one box, or if you had something that's taking up many boxes? You see what I'm asking those two questions? Yeah. So, uh, basically, memory, the way it's going to work is at the byte level. So it's address by byte. Uh, so we go to the thousand and first byte. Uh, and so the string is the number of bytes that it's length, right? I think it also stores the length before the string. So it's like the length and then the string. And so that it knows I can read the length, and then I can know how many characters there are. Um, but integers and stuff are stored as bytes. So uh, an integer is stored as eight bytes. And so it, it knows that if I go to this mailbox, I need this one and then seven more. Okay. And that's the number. So each memory location stores a byte? A byte, yeah. And, and if we have something that only requires a byte, then that's just one memory location. What if we had a variable and we said ampersand on the show me the memory address, but it took up many memory boxes as more than Yeah, it's just going to show you the first one. Oh, it just shows you the first one. And then the first one points to the next one inside uh, somehow? No, it, the compiler, uh, so th this is where it gets a little complicated because the, the instructions the computer runs, they're all things like add and get this thing from memory and they know how to interpret the data. So you give it that address and it knows, oh, that's a number that I'm working with. So the types and stuff, they sort of disappear when you finally have your final program. Your final program is not, it's, it's, it's running the assembly version, not the Go version. Can you push the up key real quick? Yeah, so if we looked at the... Uh, you can see this file is very large. Uh, 1.9 megabytes. Uh, so, I'm going to ask this question. Why are Go binaries so big? Right, because this is a, I mean, this program is very simple, right? Yeah. So why does it result in a 1.9 megabyte? Okay, so the reason why is Go programs are statically compiled, which means they have everything they need in order to run as part of their executable. Most programs in most operating systems are dynamic, which means they have their program and then they load other libraries. So it turns out there's a whole lot of code needed to do things like the format print line. And it is also the case that Go includes a lot of other things that make it uh, really nice to use, but that have to be part of the binary in the end. Uh, so it's garbage collected, it has a task scheduler for, for concurrency, all this other stuff. Uh, so that's why the binary is so big. That makes it a little hard when we like, want to like, investigate what our binary is, because it's huge, right? There's all this other code that we don't necessarily care that much about. But I'm just showing you that it's there, right? And so that, that's the process. I have my Go code, I can convert it into this binary. This binary is in code the computer understands. And then it loads into memory and runs. Um, so this is actually faster than otherwise? Uh, have everything in binary first and then run it? Then yeah, because an interpreter. Yeah, because the interpreter's got to do it on the fly. Right. Is that what you mean, Bob? So I'm saying that it takes more memory, more temporary memory to run the program, but it goes faster because everything's turned by binary. Uh, it doesn't have to do the, so actually like c converting source code into the assembly can be a pretty uh, hard task. Uh, so like a language like JavaScript, one of the nice things about the Go language is it's very uh, consistent and simple, and JavaScript is actually kind of complicated. Um, and there are examples I can show you where uh, it's actually hard to parse, and so because of that you need a sophisticated program to do it, and once you have that sophisticated program it can be a little slow. Uh, so executing JavaScript can be kind of slow. Um, now, in some sense, it doesn't matter because computers today are so fast, so who cares? Uh, but yes, this would be faster. Like, I have it already compiled, I just need to run it. So, what, what, can you just go through like one line of it and say, like, uh, on the, all the way to the left, you have zero, one, you know, what does that mean? Okay. Zero, one, five. I will show you a 
different uh, different version of this. That's human reason. <laughs> uh, if this works. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of human readable. <laughs> and so this is this is translating that hex dump we saw into the instructions. So these are the instructions, things like move, yeah. multiply, etc. <laughs> and and here's the data, and it's telling you where it came from. Uh, and so this is mapping those instructions for you. Uh, so if we were to look through this, we would find our strings and stuff. They're all in there somewhere. Okay, so it gets really. Uh, Is it also uh, mapping the blank spaces? Yeah, it, it's all in there. Um, so there it is. So the ghost string, hello world. Um, so another thing uh, about the computer, I mean, I'm sort of giving you the abstraction, but the concrete is more complex. Uh, it turns out it's not just by byte, uh, it's actually aligned. Uh, so, so maybe you need 16 bytes or 8 bytes or, or whatever. And so Go will insert dummy data to make it line up at the right boundaries because the computer's faster if you get it aligned properly. Uh, so it, it, it gets complicated, but the idea of, oh, it's main memory, I'm storing all my data in main memory uh, is useful to understand. So our types, right, it's like I have types, but they're things that we're using for our benefit, but the computer itself is just like, it's just data. Uh, it's just bytes. Um, we're interpreting the bytes, but they're just bytes. Um, right. And that's what the address is giving our address, and we can see that idea of the mailbox. Uh, okay, so that's the basic idea of memory. We occasionally do need to use this, like to have an idea of what's happening. Um, I can talk briefly about like how, how Go, what it's doing, like where it puts things, uh, where this actually kind of matters. So. When we have a function like this, this x, uh, basically Go has uh, two places to put things. So you have your big memory, right? And you have your, your function up here, right? You have your uh, source code stuff. Right, so this is like the code that's running. And then you're gonna have a segment of the memory that's called the stack, and then a segment of memory called the heap. Okay. And when you run your program, when I say var x string, it's going to put that in the stack. So it's going to create a, a space up here, you know, hello world. And so it's like put it in on the stack. Okay. And you know this has a number. The, that's the two o dot dot dot, like that huge number we saw. That's where this is. And the way the stack works is. It lives for the lifetime of the function. So when I do this, it, it exists. But then when it's done, it goes away. Okay? So the way the stack works is every time I call a function, it adds down. And then each time the function finishes, it goes back up again. Okay? And so the data on the stack disappears when the function finishes. The nice thing about that is it's really easy to, you don't have to worry about having extra data. Because if we just created data and never got rid of it, we'd run out of memory. So that's why the stack is useful. Now it turns out that there are a lot of problems where you can't do that. Uh, where I need to like pass this to another function, or I need to return this, or and those kind of things you end up having in the heap. Okay? And the idea of the heap is lots of stuff, anything can be put in here. It can come from anywhere. Any function could have created it. Okay? And then anything can reference stuff in the heap. But it doesn't go away automatically. And so the reason why Go is called the garbage collective programming language is because the heap is automatically managed. For you. There's a process that every once in a while goes through, looks for everything in the heap, sees if anything's still using it. If it's not, gets rid of it, clears it, uh, and it allows people to use that to block them. Okay? So when we run our Go programs, we generally don't have to think a lot about this. We can work at that higher level of just thinking, oh, variables and values, and I can think like that. But it's nice to know that what's going on behind the scenes is it's putting them in the stack, or it's putting them on the heap, and then instructions are because sometimes this can matter. Uh, and in this case, if you can put something on the stack, that's faster than putting it in the heap, because stack stuff doesn't have to be garbage collected. 
pricing sometimes. So just something to think about. But can you control where you're putting it? Uh, kind of. So in language like C, you have a lot of control from where you put that. Um, and in Go, generally, you don't control that. It's, it's automatic. Going to the, stack. It, the compiler figures out whether it needs to put it on the heap or not. And if it does, it does. But if it doesn't, it puts it on the stack. So it figures that out for you. Uh, and so it's not generally something you have to worry about. And that's kind of the point, right? It's, it's to make it so that we can think about programming our problem and not have to think about, oh, yeah, I forgot to clean up memory. Uh, I have to allocate and deallocate memory. And that's basically all you do in C, is think about allocating and deallocating memory. So uh, this frees us to focus on our specific problem. But it's nice to know what it's doing. So the heap is garbage collected. The stack is not. Right. And then what? What are? How? And when you when you create a variable, it goes into the stack. Is that right? Or it goes into the? Uh, it depends on whether or not it's. Uh, it does what's called escape analysis to determine whether or not where it puts it. Mm -hmm. So like this so, example, we put it in the stack. Okay. So it makes its determination of where to put it. And are there any other things to know about the stack and the heap other than those are just two separate areas that you think it's good to know about? Um. I've heard like, you know, the stack is uh, kind of bup, 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 so last in is first out. It's like a stack. You yep. put it on top. It has to come off. Yep. There's something about that. And I'm not sure if the heap is also LIFO or if it's, you know, a queue, first in, first out, or is there anything about that? Um, just curious. I mean, I've heard those phrases so many times. I don't feel like I have an understanding of stack and heap. Heap is just a pile. It, yeah, heap is a pile. Stack of is, if you, you have that big stack of oh, okay. in your business office. And yeah. the secretary keeps coming in and stuck more heaps on your desk and you're just like, oh man, this sucks. <laughs> this is why you don't have a lot of function calls because it, it floods the stack and you really can't do much with it once it's all filled up. It's very expensive to have a function call, period. It used to be the, the stack you would push and pull off, right? Yeah. Yeah. And see. <laughs> you would just go to an address and take it. It's expensive to have a function call. Yeah, it's expensive in memory and CPU. So, um, sorry, I seem to be asking the tangent questions today. <laughs> just, no, know, it's okay. I've heard so, these phrases so many times. Yeah. Like, I'd like to understand stack and heap. I think more there's important. lots of, so the stack in general is just like you said, you push things and then you pop them. So the way if I had, uh, you know, if I had main and then I had F1 and F2, and part of F1 it calls F2, and main calls F1. At, at this point, we're going to end up with a stack that has, uh, you know, main, and then it's going to have F1, and then it's going to have F2, right? It's going to do the stuff for F2. It's going to pop back up, and then it's going to pop back up again, and then eventually it'll be over. So, so that's exactly right. The stack is going up and down, and up and down, and up and down through the lifetime of the program. Um, and that's why you don't have to do garbage collection because you just go back up, and everything that was there is cleared out. You don't care about it. The heap could be allocated in lots of ways. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know the exact way that Go chooses to do so, but basically it has to manage it. So it has to keep a list of pointers and it has to know what things are pointing to where and it has to allocate and deallocate blocks of memory. And so that's a really complicated problem. Uh, and that's actually the focus of most of the work on like improving performance in a Go program is making that process better. Um, as far as uh, function calls in our sense, and it can be expensive. The other thing you should know about Go is that as a compiled language, it has a lot of optimizations. And so if it sees a really simple function, it may do what's called inlining the function, which means it doesn't, doesn't do this. It like takes the code of the function and puts it in the other function. It just runs it directly. So uh, it, it, it will sometimes inline functions, and then it's way faster. So in general, you just don't, have, you don't think about what it's doing that often. Right? It's only when you run into issues where you have to like dig in deep. I, I just thought it might be helpful to kind of have an idea of, you know, what's this magic it's doing? It's, it's actually fairly straightforward. It works very much like most other programming languages. Um, Thanks. So yeah, that's that's memory. Any questions about memory? We didn't <laughs> that's a really dangerous discover. question to ask. Yeah, there's probably <laughs> lots of questions about memory. Uh, I will say that one thing to keep in mind about memory is there's a lot of it. Um, and I think people underestimate the size of your memory. Like, 
let's say you have 16 gigs of RAM, that's a lot of data. Um, you know, when your strings are like 11 bytes, I mean, that's nothing. <laughs> and so sometimes I think we folk, we're like, oh, it uses so much memory. It's like, who cares, you know? Use it as much as you want, you have so much. And so, yeah. Um, which actually, one of the neat things about Go is, is that a, a lot of its focus is on, uh, it's not so much making a more efficient program, is it's at using resources that you have available, uh, right? And so it's like the problem isn't, we're not making programs fast enough, it's we have these massive supercomputers and we're doing nothing with them. I have 64 gigs of RAM and I'm using one gig, right? If I have that much, I should try to use it, right? And so that's one of the things that Go does well is it tries to use those resources available. When we look at concurrency, we'll really see that, right? Whereas we've been making these sort of serial programs with we add concurrency, it's like running lots of programs at once. And so now we can use the full bunch of computer instead of just that small bit of So even though Go is going to be slower than C, when you add in this component of using resources, it can be faster. Okay. So just a hand check. How many people understand when he says cereal, you, you, you don't think of Cheerio? Do you understand what he's talking about? Let me see your hands when you say cereal. How many people, ah, I'm not sure what cereal is? So just like a cereal killer, one after another, all right? That's cereal, it's one after another. You have your cereal port or USB, universal cereal bus. USB sends zeros and ones one after another, one in a line. So we've been doing cereal our code's been executing just in a line, right? One out instruction after another. Concurrent concurrency is uh, concurrent, many at a time. Parallel, parallel. So parallel would be another, yeah. Parallel process. What? Serious? Non-atomic. Like electrical current. Either in series or All right, sorry, I just can't help to interject a little bit of introduction to computer <laughs> concepts every now and then. Yeah. So, so the idea being that everybody's computer here today has multiple cores and can run more than one program at a time. And we still tend to write programs as doing one thing at a time. And so we're not utilizing what we have available. So Go makes it easier to utilize what's available. So that's, that's all I think about it. Um, OK, I think this will be the last thing we cover today. It's also like the, the sort of last component of making basic simple programs. And that's control structures. Um, OK, hang on one sec. Yeah,